Season 3 is powered by crowdfunding. Welcome to Oceanside Chat, Light Beyond Generations. This podcast was created to inspire, motivate, and provide insight through industry professionals sharing personal stories, career aspirations, and practical advice. Our guest is Rajesh Gupta, a founding director of the Halijolu Data Science Institute and a distinguished professor of computer science and engineering at UC San Diego. His research is in embedded and cyber physical systems, with a focus on sensor data organization and its use in optimization and analytics. Time to get your feet wet in the business world and join us down by the water as we have an Oceanside Chat. Season 3, Episode 4, The Future of Data-Driven Innovation Welcome to Oceanside Chat, Light Beyond Generations. I'm Helen Wong, the host and creator of the program. We are recording this episode live at the University of California, San Diego, with students from my Innovation to Market classes. Today, we live in the information age, where our society has created a new world beyond the physical one. This new world is a virtual world that contains a data ecosystem with information on every aspect of our society. Data has become vital and often referred to as new oil. And data is defining the characteristics of the 21st century. For all of these reasons, we should ask ourselves how we will handle this technology. How can we get the most out of it? How can we mitigate risks? And what roles do we play? History has taught us that when it comes to developing new technologies and discovering new science, we always have more questions than answers for their impact on society. Therefore, this is another episode triggered by my curiosity to explore a fast emerging field, the future of data-driven innovation. Our guest today is the founding director of the Data Science Institute at University of California, San Diego, whom I met through Chancellor Kostler. We have collaborated in many strategic initiatives, including the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation, where I am the chair of the board. However, this is the first time we sit down to learn about his technical expertise through the Oceanside platform. Please join me in welcoming Rajesh Gupta, the founding director of Hali Julu Data Science Institute and a distinguished professor of computer science and engineering at the University of California, San Diego. Rajesh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Helen. Good to see you. Whose life seems most fulfilling to you? What their life look like? For me, I made that choice early on as a child. I always thought I wanted to be at the forefront of learning new things and doing new things. So to me, at least at those days, the example was one of a teacher. And so I aspire to become a teacher. And after working in the industry and so on, that's where I sort of got to. But really, what we're beginning to find is that the subject areas that we were taught and the subject area that we found more interesting they have started to come together in ways in which we never at least thought where the connections are discovered in areas that have very little to do with each other. For example, when we think about our world in deterministic terms, the physical world, then how does it connect to the world of the mind where you have a notion of a free will? Very different topic areas, but they are connected. So we are beginning to find that the subject areas and the knowledge areas are evolving from natural to humanistic to now a whole new levels of awareness. At the end of the day, being able to understand and make connections intellectually is from, to me the most fascinating part. You graduated from India's best university, the Indian Institute of Technology. From my research, the acceptance rate is between 0.5% and 2.5%, just as compared to 4%, which is the lowest acceptance rate among top universities in the U.S. For example, Stanford, where you got your PhD in electronic engineering. So I'm curious about what IIT taught you that influenced the rest of your life. 
It was actually more of an accident for me than I planned. In fact, my parents wanted me to become a doctor. And it just turns out that I was having a difficult time memorizing things, but I loved math. In those days, you had to choose between biology and math, and I sort of switched without even telling them in my final senior year to math and without any idea as to where we will end up with. It turns out a chance encounter with somebody who told me about IIT exam, which we took, and a long history after that. Even though it is a technical school, it actually was much, much more than technical school. In fact, we were required to take eight humanities courses, and most of my courses were philosophy at that time. But not only humanities, we also had woodworking, we had steel welding, we had a technical arts class, which was called programming. And in programming in those days was technical arts and was not a scientific topic. In all of those areas, it did give us quite a bit of skills of the hand. In other words, things that we did ourselves, we created things. And I think that was the biggest defining experience of IIT. Of course, it was a group of very smart people and so on. And then you lived together for five years. You built very close relationships as well. And the subject areas were definitely well covered, no question about it. But I think it was the breadth of the experience that sort of defined for me. So you joined the UC San Diego in 2002. How did you first get involved with data science and what made you want to learn more about it? So data science in early years, and for majority of us, we were already doing data science without the title of data science. We were already doing, things, whether you're a statistician or in my case, electron engineer and so on, we we're already looking at methods that allowed us to, for example, take the metrics data sets and find ways in which you can decompose it for predicting the state of the system and so on. So it's not like there is a moment in which you were starting doing data science and you were not doing data science before. It is part of the overall intellectual milieu that we have all been exposed to. You started developing UCSD's Data Science Institute in 2017. Since my class is about practicing an entrepreneurial mindset and building an innovation ecosystem, we'd love to hear from you the founding story of HDSI. So the founding story of HDSI actually goes, the year I became chair of my computer science department was also the year our oldest son was applying for college. And suddenly I was seeing the college experience through the eyes of a parent. My own son was heading at that time to college and I started looking at it as to how he will, for example, experience what we teach and so on. There were many things to like, but there were many things that I did not quite appreciate or like. One of them was that we were really, really popular major computer science was. What that meant was that our classes were very large. A lot of people wanted to get into our classes and we were doing our best to discharge our classes and instructions. But in the meantime, I was thinking that, look, the student in our class will sit into a program where in a lecture hall with 200 students and they may not even know majority of the students sitting close to them from one class to the other, let alone the entire program. It was very different from IIT. In IIT, there were total 34 students in my own engineering major, and we knew all of them at the very close level. And so I thought, well, this is not the right experience. More importantly, the instructor who is teaching 200 students would not be able to recall five names from their own classroom. So we sort of imagined a way of creating a program in which the students were a lot more mentored, which means there was a final year project. We also made sure that all the required courses were done by the end of the third year so that in the senior year, you actually focused on courses you like, electives, and your projects. There were many such innovations that came in. Much more importantly, the computer science itself was evolving and growing into many, many different areas. And we were looking for a structure that would make sense. And this is where a similar development was happening in cognitive science and mathematics and so on. They were also seeing the students with their training also going into this area, which was emerging to be data centric. So we sort of got together and I set up a steering committee at that time as chair of computer science to build up a educational program with some very simple guidelines. The degree program has to last forever. In other words, the knowledge that we give and the skills we give cannot be obsolete immediately a few years after graduation. Much more importantly, if you did a bachelor's in data science, it should cover what was required master's degree in data science from coming out of other majors. In other words, all the knowledge was covered there. So the team worked for a year. It took another year for it to be actually reviewed and approved. And the undergraduate programs go through a lot of scrutiny. 
and we created the undergraduate program before we launched the institute to host it because we were very focused on first getting the program right. Once the program was in place, that's when we launched the SDSI as an institute to host the program. And of course, once you have an undergraduate program, then the natural thing is what the doctor program look like and what about people who are coming from non-data science backgrounds to actually do a master's and so on. And all of those things came together very nicely to today when we have Heligiolo Data Science Institute hosting all our graduate and undergraduate programs with about 1,400 graduates and undergraduate students together and 26 faculty members we have recruited in SDSI. And of course, as to how I got started into building institution around data science, simply because the need emerged and the opportunity to actually serve that need also emerged at the same time. In other words, faculty members and researchers from mathematics, cognitive science, computer science, electrical engineering, and these areas already were talking to each other. So it was relatively obvious how to bring these people together in a coherent manner and data science provided that umbrella. For all those years that I know you, I admire you as an entrepreneur in the academia world. You did such a fantastic job, launched a new institute with all the programs you mentioned in such a short time. Well, a project like this is never an individual accomplishment, even though we take pride in it. It really happens because there are a lot of people who got together and they selflessly worked on it to make this happen. Whether it is recruiting faculty, devising courses, offering courses, creating experimental stuff, and so on. So I've been very blessed with pulling together a community on campus and not just data science department, but actually people drawn from many founding departments of computer science, mathematics, cognitive science, and other departments, so bioengineering, for example, who had faculty member who came in, spent extra time with us, offered courses. They still are doing that. Their departments offered us spaces to host our students, to host our classes. So I'm happy to have coordinated that, but really the credit belongs to a very large community of people. To put things in context, what is data science in the simplest version of its definition? Data science, there have been many attempts to define it. We are beginning to recognize certain core competencies that are required for somebody to work, to deal in the world of data, whether inferring from data, even organizing data, navigating data, putting data to some use. Those skills today go through a number of established disciplines. The computing infrastructure is one of them. Mathematics, statistics is another one because it is one of the oldest fields that sort of built around data, for example. We're also beginning to find out that other departments, including cognitive science, electrical engineering, and so on, actually have areas, whether it's information theory or whether it is human brain or cognition, that intersects with data. That is beginning to create a new domain of data-driven knowledge. When we say, what is data science? It is really a discipline in which methods and models and uses of data, including managing data itself, are put to use. How they work, when they don't work, when they should be applied, what is the underlying reasoning behind them, whether it's mathematics or a new kind of mathematics or from reasoning, those are all part of the data science area. I'm curious about the word choice to describe data as a science. In other words, why is it a science, not technology? That distinction is really an artificial one. And it actually goes back to the tradition of engineering. And as you probably know, engineering arose as a polytechnic in, in the past uh, from natural sciences. But it had a certain flavor where no amount of science or knowledge in physics or chemistry will make you an engineer. You needed to think about things a bit differently. You had to add certain skills in addition to knowledge. And that's what engineering brought together. So we started making a distinction from polytechnic became engineering because engineering itself got formalized. So we started making a distinction with technology as an application of a no knowledge area of science. Really, both of them are nothing but philosophy. It's really love of knowledge and discovery of knowledge. And so you can think of data science as a new philosophy both natural as of mind as well. But people do in the marketplace make a distinction between data engineering and data science, for example, or data technology. What they have in mind are natural skills, for example. Data technologies are mostly computational skills, whereas data science are mostly applied skills, which are mathematical and so on. But I think it's so fluid that it is almost trying to define the boundary of a amoebic structure, which is changing. That distinction is not that significant, except for a very immediate term as to what is knowledge and skill areas. 
is data science similar or interchangeable terms with many other popular terminologies? Let me give you a few examples. Artificial intelligence, AI, computer science, big data, machine learning, data analytics, and the list go on and on. So what's your view about that? Yeah, uh, the way to think about that is that there are intersections. Some of these disciplines are much, much older. Computer science, of course, is an older discipline. Statistics is even more. But when we talk about artificial intelligence, it actually doesn't talk about an area. It talks about an aspiration. In other words, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking something that goes beyond reasoning by humans. Now, some people say, well, maybe it is not artificial intelligence. It's more intelligence amplification. And then there's a debate about how much automation is there or should be there. The way to think about a discipline really is how the knowledge gets created and who puts that knowledge to use. For example, when we talk about electrical engineering, it's not about electricity or electrons, even though that might have been the, the source of it. It's about batteries, it's about wireless, it's about information, it's about something else, right? So same thing here with data science. Not necessarily everything is about data. What it is about is putting data to use to some purpose, whether it is a cognitive purpose, whether it is a sociological purpose, whether it is an engineering purpose. And so I think in that sense, the area is going to be evolving and how it will be defined over time, we can only guess today. That's perfect. It leads to my next question. Can you describe a few practical applications to better understand the concept? Yeah, so that I think we are beginning to understand very well. For example, we are already seeing our daily lives affected by how data science has been put to use. If you have a look at your iPhone and it recognizes your face, there is quite a bit of technology, but there's also data that is making that possible. If you are able to uncover underneath a painting, there is a domain of data. If you are able to uncover genomic sequences and find how ancient disease evolved, for example, from Black Death to today, that is also a province of data. So there are a number of practical applications beginning to come up with respect to the automation of data into real lives. But again, the promise is pretty early. The areas where we have made progress are the areas where the safety or the security requirements have been somewhat loose. As we go further on, where the requirements of safety and trustworthiness will increase, requirements of uh, timely response will increase, I think the new technologies will emerge. Does data science rely on human intelligence to interpret the data and form opinions and judgments? Now you're asking a question which is more crossing from science to beliefs. And of course, people have different beliefs on their own. I often think of AI or data science as enhancing something rather than substituting something, whether it's intelligence or inference or human judgment and so on. So in that sense, I see that a successful application rated science will allow us to reason through uncertainty in a more systematic way to the extent that it can even be made possible to automate it in some limited application areas, for example. Will anything replace human judgment? You know, this is now a, a more of a question, not of science, but one of a philosophical outlook. And it's hard for me to say that without attaching first level of significance to that judgment. If the judgment is about driving around an obstacle, yeah, sure. I think that is something we're beginning to see early signs of, for example, as the perception and cognition methods increase and the technology advances, we ought to be able to see much more clearly through the fog, for example, <laughs> if you will, of real life. But when it comes to judgment, which are of sociological nature, for example, predicting how a potential spouse or a potential employee or a criminal intent, I think we are going to be much further away until we have a much closer understanding of human mind itself and areas which are also evolving. But I think that a lot more physical sciences needs to be done before data science can take a step ahead of that. How does domain expertise, such as engineering, finance, supply chain, business, connect to data science? Oh, significantly, to the extent that when we conceived of HDSI, we thought of it as a hub for something rather than a domain of itself. It cannot live without the engagement of the domain scientist. If you're going to be modeling climate or if you're going to be modeling fisheries or if you're going to be modeling human behavior without the climate scientist or the social scientist and so on, you're not going to be able to make the impact. The difference, of course, is that unlike engineering in early years where you could create an artifact because these were physical artifacts mostly 
and if you will, throw it over the wall to the practitioner, science and technology distinction, and that created new products, for example. Here, you actually want the domain experts to also become data science experts to the point of not necessarily advancing data science directly, but knowing where the advances in data science are actually coming from and providing input to that. So I think that is why data science is more like the early years natural philosophy, where the scientists were also philosophers uh, in the sense of not only asking questions of general nature, but also experimenting with natural world in order to develop a closer understanding of what is it that makes our physical world. Except that our challenge today is much harder because now we are also approaching the realm of a word of mind and word of society. So the role of our domain experts and domain scientists is strong that half the appointment of his DSI faculty members are actually appointed in other departments. And the reason is very simple. We cannot make advance in medicine, for example, without MD or medicine researcher looking at this data and so on. So when I mentioned data science, which team composition come to your mind being the best team and what culture are you trying to cultivate? For example, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, so we have often used the word transdisciplinary. And the reason we do is because we don't think of data science belongs in the interstitial spaces of other domains. We also do not think about it just as a heterogeneous collection of multiple areas. But what we think is that it is an integrated whole in which some of the other domains are actually included either in part or completely. And in that sense, it is a transdisciplinary area where you actually have to know without a boundary, some other domain as well. So we have biologists, for example, neurobiologists, who is also a data scientist. We have a philosopher who is also a data scientist. Our latest hire, for example, is studies climate models and aerosols and builds data models on those and runs those experiments as well. It's not that we take data from some domain and then come up with conclusions for methods, but we actually are part of the data generation, collection, curation, and imputation process itself. People using data to make decisions, right? However, there has been a lot of ongoing discussion and concerns about facts versus opinions. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, actually, data science has opened up our eyes towards a number of fallacies we have had in our daily lives. Almost like the way early mathematics and model logic started making contradictions of, uh, obvious or tautologies obvious in public discourse. So, for example, simple logical analysis will tell you that this conclusion is not correct. But when it came to the data science, we are now beginning to find out that inferencing is much more complex than what we have been used to, and especially causal inference. In other words, detecting the probable cause versus effect and distinguishing it from, for example, confounding factors or indirect relationships and so on. So multiple notions of causality are being explored are actually already part of some of the areas like experimental design and so on. So we begin to find out that, for example, how does biases of our language, how does the biases of our literature enter into our inferencing process? This is one thing we're learning in large language models currently, where biases, which are sometimes part of our heritage, by the way, part of our culture, and they are therefore reflected in our literature. So whatever literature you use to train the machine on these models would also spit out those biases and so on. I'll give you some example just to sort of give you an idea as to how we are finding this challenging. It's something that the data science is uniquely positioned. So let me give you some ideas about that. We are very used to numbers. For example, you run a psychological test or you run a psychological survey and you ask people to rate in every question from one to 10 a number. And sometimes those numbers don't make sense because numbers have one property that the real life does not. And numbers are always completely ordered. You take any two numbers, one is always smaller than the other. But when you take any two objects, so it's not necessarily a comparison in any sense. So now the language you use to reason is not the language that actually applies in real life. So imagine, for example, you're seeking your friends and you got five friends, candidates, you list their names and you list all their characteristics and assign them some weights. And then you do a sum total them and then you get a number out of them and then say, so, oh, well, this has the highest number. This will be my friend. And you can replace friend by spouse, for example. But is that the right way to think about it? Probably not. And the reason is the moment we turn everything into a number, we induce it order on our characteristics when it does not exist. 
which is why sometimes when we take polls and we add up numbers on metrics, for example, even sometimes when we interview people for a job and we just add numbers up, characteristic A, characteristic B, characteristic C, and then who has the highest score, we are actually doing a disservice because we are substituting logic by numbers and that logic does not work. Now, in real life, this wasn't that big a case in the past, but now if you are all data and all data is nothing but numbers and numbers are totally ordered, you are going to make many more mistakes. So the, the new methods have to develop that allow you to go past the numerical property of data into something else. And I think this is where we are beginning to make some progress. And I was very pleased to see some of this open AI effort that come out where the answer to a question could be, it cannot be answered or this question should not be answered. Mm, that's super interesting. Are there yeah. ethical challenges? Oh, significantly more. In fact, the way to think about it is this way. When the science came, it was about knowledge. You know, from Aristotle days to later on, you had a set of facts. And what engineering did was they added the skills to the facts. So for example, what could you do with these facts? Can you make a stronger steel? Can you do something else with it? So knowledge and skills became the two legs upon which our entire knowledge system, academic system is based today. What data science has done is added a whole new dimension to this. And I call that dimension awareness. And what do I mean by that? If you talk to an engineer and you ask her, I can make this battery smaller, let's say 10% is smaller. The response would be, yeah, sure, do it. In fact, if you can make it 20%, even better. In other words, how high can you reach? Let's do that. Nobody asked the question, should we even do that? But when you have a data sets, and I said to you that I'm talking to you, Helen, and I have now algorithms that can read your mind or just read your heart rate, for example, the first reaction will be, well, after you get past the creepiness, is this something you should do? I'm not even going to technological feasibility. So being aware of the limitations of what you can do or even what you're doing, can this method be applied for this data sets? These limitations, they are now becoming a part of every single course we teach, for example. And I think in future, you will have knowledge, skill, and awareness. All three come up. So ethics is one of those. Ethics in many ways is, again, whether it's situational, contextual, or permanent across all the times, will become a part of this awareness. And so I think with data science, we have sort of brought the notion of awareness of ethics to the fore, simply because the effects are significant. I have a question from student. Data can be very useful, but what power does it have if people cannot understand it? How do you think we can bridge the gap of understanding? It's a very difficult problem, actually. It comes under multiple names. When we talk about data visualization, for example, it's a very primitive art. And I say it with all humility, there are not that many research groups working on it because, you know, much of this scientific technological growth was driven through STEM areas, especially engineering. And there we were just not used to the skills and the methods needed to worry about human engagements. Human interfaces are a much more recent phenomenon, and they are now beginning to be explored in multiple different ways. For example, there are areas such as design that sort of beginning to pay more attention to the humans and so on. So we are definitely far behind in this area than we are in many other areas, simply because this has not been a part of the culture in terms of understanding these problems. And you can imagine if you're an engineer, how do you write a thesis or do a project that deals with humans? On the other hand, if you're a social scientist, then the technological parts are not that much there. So I think this is the need that data science is actually beginning to fill, where we put people into room together who would normally never be. So Rajesh, this class, Innovation to Market, is a quarter-long class to transform an idea into a pitch deck for a new venture. Mm -hmm. Every venture, regardless of the nature of the business, will generate data. In other words, data always exists, whether you think of using them or not. But why has the data science become more important than ever? What has changed? The data science has become important because the nature and scale of data has changed. There was always data, but the nature of the data has changed where the data is no longitudinal. What used to be a sample point is now a time series. What used to be a sample point is now a series of data over the space, for example. The data itself has become heterogeneous. So the same phenomena is captured in multiple different ways, whether it is a Twitter feed or a video feed or a conversations and so on. So it's heterogeneous as well. 
So the niche and the scale of the data has changed. And on top of that, the methods and tools and the infrastructure to actually digest data has also changed significantly. You know, it took Milankovic years to compile data that can probably be done in an afternoon today. And it's not just because the slide rule was replaced by calculator, but also the tools that allow us to take the data sets and spin it and sanitize it and clean it and so on. So what used to take humanity would take hundreds of years can actually be done in much fewer of time, which means a lot more discovery is possible. But to do that in a way requires much more sophisticated training than in the past. You take the data and maybe you put it on an expert sheet and now you are on your own. And maybe you learned a bit about pinning and so on, but not much more than that. It turns out that the methods for extracting knowledge out of data are already very sophisticated. So that requires us to now do a systematic study of the subject, but not only for the knowledge and the skills that you need, but also for the awareness, which cannot happen on their own, which is why a discipline needs to emerge. Mm -hmm. So what are the latest methodologies or approaches that entrepreneurs should be aware when it comes to data management? So there is a difference between data management, which basically means curation. Curation means basically organization into structures and then navigation through that. There are some trends that are emerging. For example, for a long time, the relational algebra of data organized by categories was very popular because it allowed us to combine, to join, to make inferences from tabular data, for example. And these were the relational databases over time. More recently, unstructured data or semi-structured data has become more and more popular, sometimes even self-defining or auto-categorizing. In this case, the new kinds of models that are emerging also, for example, graphical networks or graphical neural networks, so some forms of the graphs and so on in which the data is organized. The structure of the graph itself carries certain information that can be captured. So those are the new methods that are emerging. Majority of the entrepreneurs, I would say, will be aware of advances that neural networks have brought in one form or the other. Sometimes they call deep neural networks. Whether they are with feedback or not with feedback or they are with part of a larger generative network, but those areas are rapidly moving. There are practical tools that allow one people to navigate present, for example, data that are emerging as well. But I think going forward with all these, the new methods of actually being able to do synthetic things, being able to generate things are going to be becoming even more interesting. Sometimes for creative values, for example, you know, synthesize images, synthesize videos, or even synthesize text or aces that have been coming across. But I think much more importantly, they get us closer to reasoning, but a new form of reasoning you know, through the data sets. So for example, if those methods that are synthetic in terms of, uh, let's say, chatting and, and interaction systems, then they can also be repurposed into helping us navigate the data sets itself. And therefore, another level of intelligence builds in that enhances human capability for navigating data sets. So how much data would qualify for big data? We hear big data all the time. So is there a threshold for that? No, there is no none. It's an old saying that the data size is not a size of physical size. In fact, the value of the data is more important than the size of the data. For example, you can have bots that recognize, let's say, animals or plants on image data. But somebody who's reading a radiological x-ray and detecting aneurysm or blockage or lung condition, that's a specialist. And so the specialist notes are not that much but the data is valuable because it presents a huge amount of knowledge. We can mine large amounts of data, but what does it mean actually for itself? So that's not a size of the data. The next thing is data itself is hierarchical. Maybe at the bottom most sensory data, for example, your GPS or IMU data, inertial measurement unit data could have lots of data values how each of joint of your body moves, how much acceleration, how much force, and so on. But what human activity does it represent? Maybe a metadata. So data is at multiple levels of hierarchy. And even though the size will change, its value might actually increase. So how to differentiate high value or good data versus bad data? The distinction is the robustness of the decisions that can be made on that. And so it's very context specific. What are you looking to do with that data? 
if in case you're trying to solve a problem where a precise answers can be given, that's great. Right? For example, the probability of a particular blob of a picture being a cat or a dog or a cat of a certain type, those are robust decisions, for example. But on the other hand, if you are trying to infer, for example, something that is not there or something that requires a stretch of imagination, for example, based on the record of healthcare, is this person likely to survive or not? Or is this person likely to be successful on a job, for example? Those are much harder questions. And then the quality of data, even though it is important, but even the inference process itself is also subject to question. So in places where the inference process is well understood, we can define the quality of data by various measures. And then in fact, there are many scientific measures to do that. And that sort of detector that allows us to ask questions about completeness or meeting certain necessary conditions for making inferences, for example. We classify data or group data and make them to pattern recognition. We can make a better decision, quantified. But do outliers matter? Yes, outliers always matter. And it's very context sensitive. In some cases, an outlier may be useless because it causes overfitting and it prevents us from making generalized conclusions, for example. And especially when you look at sociological data and you look at outliers, then making generalizations based on that doesn't make sense. On the other hand, in places like medical data, outliers might well be the inferential drivers of the conclusions. So the outliers by themselves don't mean much. They meet in the value in the context of the inference being made. Data has become a source of innovation and differentiation for companies. As of 2022, global AI market is valued over $136 billion. AI industry value is projected to increase by over 13 times over the next eight years. And the U.S. AI market is forecast to reach to almost 300 billion by 2026. So what have been those enabling and driving forces of innovation in data science? Well, first it was just the data. So for example, if you remember early days of GPS, when the GPS came, it allowed you to do triangulation, but triangulation was useless unless you had a map of it. So the first thing was the companies that had the detailed maps, for example, became valuable themselves because the map was the data. So as your GPS localized you to a certain point on earth, what actually was at that location was the mapping information and mapping information needed to come from somewhere. So the earliest entrepreneur possibilities were enabling others to do data science. In other words, output data to use by having data sets that others can use. Some of them was public information like biobanks and so on. Some were subscribed like Nielsen's rating data sets, some of which is public and some is not. But in all of those cases, the data itself was valuable. Some of that data, whether it was a physical world or humans and so on, whether it was fairly collected or unfairly collected, doesn't matter, became a product itself. And of course, over time, you have to be careful because some of the data, you have to worry about the consent of the persons who actually was collected from, was it collected even from a secondary market or tertiary market and so on. Then the next step was taking that data and doing something with it to create new models or new methods on top of that. For example, energy data, energy efficiency data in buildings and so on. So for example, civil networks and I think civil systems uh, did that where they took some of those building energy data and based on that, they devised new methods of reducing energy use in buildings, for example. New AI, where you put the data to use yourself and offered a product that allowed companies to do new things. For example, optimize their uh, travel expenses or their logistics or their procurement systems and so on. So that was the next level of product, which is data and data enhancement of data through metadata and through new things. Then the next step that comes up is closer to the human inference. For example, can we now use that to replace or even reduce the amount of human labor that needs to happen in recognition or mining or other tasks? And this is where we are now creating new business propositions where new set of services are being offered or even people being replaced by services, but more importantly, new services that did not exist before, maybe because the data is real time and so on. Within this class, we emphasize that students need to go collect data to validate the idea, to test their methodology, to prove that's the right solution, to even using data to ask investors to make the investment in their venture. Can data science help solve some of those challenges? The stack is very deep. So by the time I go up, it gets even more iffy, but that's where the exciting opportunities are. When we look at it as an entrepreneur, in the past, I used to characterize if you're an entrepreneur and you have a solution that you are building, 
the solution has two characteristics. It can be put on an axis of hardness versus cleverness. Hardness is you solve some problem that has eluded technologies everywhere. For example, you make the transistor happen with certain materials or more efficiently and so on. So these are called the technologically hard problems that require oftentimes many years of experience and experimentations. The second is cleverness of a solution. Cleverness of a solution is one in which the information is universally available, but you are the ones who is able to uniquely pull it together. And if somebody else were to spend enough time, they would also come to the same conclusion or similar ones. So you could characterize many startups on the two axes of cleverness and hardness. I think going forward, and data adds another dimension to it, of course, which is that it's not what you do with it, but also what you start with or what you create in terms of the data artifacts. And I think those data artifacts, for example, if you already have access to or created data either by collection or by simulation of a certain phenomena, then that gives you a certain advantage similar to the map data I was telling you about, whether the map is a physical space or is a social space or emotional space, doesn't matter. So I think new business opportunities are already appearing where the value chain starts to create new sets of needs and services and services to serve those needs for our society. What about some examples of values and lessons that we have learned? What went wrong with those? Yeah, so there was a very classic study. It was about six years ago about a software that was used to by many justices around the world to predict whether a particular person should be released on parole based on the probability that this person will receive a crime. And it was shown early on that even though this study uses a large number of parameters and data and so on, at the end of the day, it is a biased result and a black defendant was more likely to be predicted wrong to proceed to crime than a white one, for example, was. And people showed that these much simpler models without taking all that information would actually make better decisions, for example. And that sort of was the first humbling moment that big data doesn't necessarily mean you solve the problem better. Sometimes you make it worse. On the other hand, if you think it a little bit more carefully, it was a starting point because it maybe it was not big enough. Maybe it was not de-biased enough. But much more importantly, the fairness of, uh, of comparison was also wrong. A human who is biased is probably going to make much worse decisions than a software that is biased. But then we started going into generative models from large language models, and the early large language models also made mistakes. There is a lot of, I would say, gender bias or uh, racial bias that is built into our literature. It doesn't matter who wrote it and so on. When you sort of put that in, there are subtle ways and not so subtle ways in which that bias comes up. Well, when you make a machine digest all that literature and to produce a new text, for example, what do you think you're going to see? You're going to take concentration of those biases again. And we sort of saw that in early GPT models and that was the failure of it. But once people recognize what the problem was, then the new methods and new communities are, are sort of working on it to overcome that. So I'm pretty positive that as a society, will definitely be better tomorrow than we are today, and today is better than yesterday. So I think there's a monotonicity in terms of our success, but we do face many challenges, especially as the problems become more sociological. So we all have a physical identity today, but there's also digital identity. For example, I'm on LinkedIn, you know, most of our students are on Instagram, and there's like you're producing data almost every day while you're doing something. We have a question from a student. Does increased emphasis on user privacy bring any negative implication to data science? No, it brings in new challenges. But look, the notion of privacy itself will revise itself. I know we have become more sensitive to data that we used to give out easily. In fact, I remember when I came to the United States 36, 37 years ago, social security number was actually commonly used data for your identity and so on. And today, if somebody asks you for social security, you're likely not going to volunteer it. So there is a heightened sense of awareness. On the other hand, accredited reporting agencies today have so much more information than you would imagine. And some of that information is actually routinely traded. So I think the privacy presents a challenge, but without a challenge, the domain doesn't exist. So it's a technological challenge, one which we are actually beginning to grapple with in some of the new methods that have emerged. We just don't talk about it. Already we actually have both algorithms as well as data methods that are beginning to sort of even assess the nature of privacy leaks. 
for example, some of the more recent works, people are even beginning to put privacy label on it, like this particular software or this particular application. What does this label look like compared to, let's say, food label? <laughs> what is this ingredients? What is the information it is revealing and so on? And the platforms are also evolving very fast, whether it's Android or iPhone and so on. They are also catching up, but they are catching up. So, <laughs> so that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the emerging trends that will lead to the next level of data science? Oh, there are several. In terms of the emerging trends, what I personally think that, first of all, the digital twin will become much more causally connected. What I mean by that? Right now, your presence in a digital plane, whether you call it metaverse or you call it whatever the name you want to give it, what you want is one that is phase lagged and may not even be accurate compared to your physical presence. And of course, it has its own challenges of privacy and so on. But over time, I think the two will become much more connected where changes in one reflects the changes in the other. This will be important not at the individual level as much as it will be at the societal level. So for example, your transportation network, your railway network, your healthcare network, how they're performing, what are the bottlenecks, what will happen if I simulate it far enough in time for a given crisis, uh, how will the systems work and what where the bottlenecks will be. I think this will become much, much more sophisticated as the control systems and optimization methods uh, sort of catch up to that. Then there are other areas as well. For example, I was telling you about healthcare, understanding humans and health, not only at the macro scale of blood temperature and heart rate and so on, but also at micro scale at the cellular or genomic level and making inferences from there. I think that area will also become more sophisticated in the coming years. Beyond that, it is hard to predict what the technological impact will be. In fact, if you look at the history, almost any attempt to predict the impact of technology has always failed or not done very well. And so I'm very aware that trying to prognosticate what the future will look like is at best a very hazardous activity, but it will have an impact, no question. Well, we clearly have a spark of curiosity in the audience. Our students asking, what is the good way to start learning data science? The best means, especially if you're not in data science, you learn by doing things. One of the great things that has happened in the last 20 years or so is platforms have emerged that have allowed people to start to experiment with things. And the experimentations happen because the skills to do very basic things are becoming easier and easier to obtain. You cannot become a neurosurgeon or, or some other professional without long training. But you can learn programming, for example, that allows you to start to experiment with tools. Doesn't make you data scientist, but it makes you aware of what the input-output relationships are. And so if you want to learn that, there are some very interesting courses. We have our early courses like Data Science 10, where we sometimes just focus on what is the right set of questions to ask and what does the good answer look like? And can I tell a good answer from a poor answer? Is there a method to that? And then I think learning those early skills of just being able to navigate simple data sets, whether they do it in a spreadsheet or in some other complicated form, doesn't matter. But those tools have become incredibly powerful, but also easily accessible. So I would say start by learning to those. And then you have things like Jupyter Notebooks and so on that allows you to actually document what you do and apply it to different sets and so on. I think that's the starting point. And if you do well in those, you can even do online courses in that case. So we also offer online courses in that area. Then you can think about well, maybe there's a degree for me. Maybe there's a master's degree for me since I already have an undergraduate degree and so on. Or maybe I should go into this area. So what is the final thoughts of one thing you would like our audience to remember? I think the part that I would like you to remember is how our human knowledge, most broadly speaking, has evolved over time. We started by trying to understand, ask questions about why things are. We couldn't always find the answers. Sometimes the answers were found in the spiritual domains and out of which came out the whole philosophy of the love of knowledge where we started to learn by some experimentation, the components and constituents of our natural physical nature. And we have come a very long way. But when you intersect that with humans, both biologically as well as socially, these questions become even more interesting and important. And I think this is the new phase we're entering for our quote-unquote science, where our understanding of us individually and together will take quantum jumps in the years to come, in decades to come. And hopefully you'll be part of that. Hopefully you would not only be part of just enhancing that understanding, but also putting some of that understanding to use. 
Rajesh, I learned from this conversation that harnessing the value from ever increasing data resources is critical for society, for business, science, and industry. This challenge requires a collective efforts from multiple disciplined area and communities. So thank you so much for sharing your vision and insight with us. While the advancement of data science is happening rapidly and fearlessly, I hope to continue the conversation and invite you back to the program frequently and soon. And I also hope you enjoyed the chat as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So good to see you, Helen. And thank you for giving me the chance to at least share with you the word I see, but really it's more exciting. And I just love being a student in this space. Thanks for listening to Oceanside Chat. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you liked it, please share this podcast and stay tuned for our next episode. We'll see you later.